even now, Lord Jesus. Even now. Even now. For I ask this in your name. Amen. God be praised. Dr. Mel Blackaby and your beautiful wife, Sister Gina Maccabee. Thank you all for inviting me and not only inviting me, but loving me and receiving me as if I've been here for a long time. Um, I feel that God has um, initiated a fellowship between us, Pastor, that uh, will never end, continue in glory. To Dr. Gary Lewis and his wife Chrissy, and to Dr. Charles Q. Carter and Lady Margaret Carter, very, very dear friends, and to the venerable Dr. Henry Blackaby, whose life and ministry has touched mine. This is the first time I've had the privilege, sir, of meeting you, and I thank God for you and for how he has used you to literally bless the world. Second Chronicles chapter 20, Second Chronicles chapter 20, strength through weakness. Second Chronicles chapter 20, strength through weakness. Hear these words from the word, Second Chronicles 20, verses 1 through 12. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Meunites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every man, every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the tip of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now, hear men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. God brings us to strength by delivering us to weakness in order that we might discover that our strength resides in him alone. God brings us to strength by delivering us to weakness in order that we might discover that our strength resides in him alone. That sounds biblically and theologically 
correct, and responsible, I want you to say it after me. Now, however, if, if that seems a little bit heretical, forever hold your peace. But if it sounds right, say it like you mean it. God brings us to strength by delivering us to weakness in order that we might discover that our strength resides in him alone. Sounds paradoxical. Strength through weakness. A paradox occurs when two mutually exclusive statements meet at the intersection of apparent contradiction only to produce truth. It's what the famed and celebrated G.K. Chesterton of Great Britain meant when he said that a paradox is truth standing on his head, screaming for attention. As if to say, this looks bizarre, looks weird, but if you come closer, you will find great wisdom in it. If you and I really follow Jesus, we have to follow him paradoxically. After all, he said, if you really want to live, you have to die. You want to be exalted? You have to be humbled. You want to be first? You must then be last. You want to be great? You have to be a servant. You want to sit at the head of the table? You have to sit at the foot of the table. You want to find your life? You must lose your life. And hear Paul saying in 2 Corinthians 12 and 10, I glory in my weakness, in my hindrances, in my insults, in my persecution, in my difficulties. For when I am weak, then am I strong. For a paradox really is your inability to express what you have experienced. It is um, like falling in love. On August 6th of this year, Dr. Mel Blackaby will be celeb celebrating the 35th anniversary of his beautiful wife, Gina. You can ask him right now. Are you in love? Yes. Are you in love? You All right. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, he cannot really express what he has experienced. And he will stammer, as articulate as he is, and stutter to try to reach to the depth of explaining what he's experienced. And when I asked you, do you love Jesus? You know you love him, but you cannot explain how much you love him. Did you hear choir just finished singing? He's so, he's good, good. And they could have went on and on and on and on. Great, wonderful. But the end of all of that would be, oh, that's what Paul did as he piles up prodigious mountains of doctrine in Romans 1, 1 through 11. Talks about creation, talks about the doctrine of the spirit, talks about adoption, talks about justification and reconciliation, propitiation, all of that. But when he gets to verse 33 of Romans 11, he stops talking about something and he starts singing all the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways of past finding out. Did you hear what he said? Oh, and what does oh mean? Oh means I've come to the end of trying to explain what I can't explain. I've got to sing about it. It's too great. And when we follow Jesus, we follow one who 
is not logical. He's supralogical. He's beyond explaining. But as Dr. Henry Blackleby would say, you can experience the God that you'll never be able to profoundly and clearly explain. I say to you once again, God brings us to a place of strength by delivering us to weakness that we might discover that our strength resides in him alone. We need to be reacquainted with this king of the southern kingdom. His name is Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, if you flip back to the 17th chapter, just a few chapters back of 2 Chronicles, I don't want to wear your, your wrist out too much. Just flip back a little bit. In verse 3 and 4, Jehoshaphat is a righteous king. He does not consult with Baals, but he walks in the earlier ways of his father, David, and he walks according to the commandments of God. He's a righteous king. Verse 5 and verse 11, he is a rich king. The children of uh, Jerusalem, the citizens of Judah, bring him gifts. And the Bible says in verse 11 that the Philistines bring him gifts and silver and uh, the Arabs bring him livestock. So he is a rich king. Verse 6, he's a king who is leading spiritual renewal in the southern kingdom of Judah. For the Bible says he goes up to the hills, he tears down their shearer poles and the altars where idolatry was practiced, the shearer poles where there was such licentious and immoral behavior. He leads the kingdom in the spiritual renewal. In verses 7, 8, and 9, the Bible says he sends officials throughout all the towns of Judah and they are teaching the Torah, teaching the Bible because he knows that you cannot really have a revival unless the Bible is prior, central, on the main line. You can have a, you can have a survival and have several services and after the survival is over, then it's business as usual. But if you're going to have a revival... I mean something that will impact our lives and transform us. The Bible must be number one. Then the Bible says, here's a man who has a strong military regime. In verse 14, he has 300,000 soldiers. Verse 15, he has 280,000 soldiers. Verse 16, he has 200,000 soldiers. Verse 17, he has 200,000 soldiers. Verse 18, he has 180,000 soldiers. That's 1,160,000 soldiers. Verse 19, not counting those in the fortified towns of the southern kingdom. He seems to have it all together because in verse 10, the neighboring towns are afraid to attack him for there's fear on their part and God is fighting for Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom. But when God is blessing, the devil is messing. Always. If we have not met the devil lately, it may mean that we're going the same way. This is not a picnic. This is spiritual warfare. Don't think it's strange when you are attacked. It really is a compliment to you. It means that you are a threat to the devil as a church. You're a threat to the devil as a husband. You're a threat to the devil as a wife. You're a threat to the devil as a family. And therefore, he's expending energy to try to deter you from what God has called you to do. And the Bible says in verse 1 of this chapter that Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which is Edom, they are surreptitiously, privately, secretively forming a trifold coalition to attack Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom. And it is a family affair. Ammon and Moab are the children of Lot. 
incestuously, but still. And Edom is the twin brother of Esau. Family attacking family. Judah, who's the fourth son of Jacob. One of the painful things I'm seeing throughout this world, visiting, sharing, is a lack of unity within families, estrangement. The greatest pain that you will suffer within, oh, really, that you'll suffer will come from your family. Somebody in your family that you let in your bosom that will hurt your heart. And as a result of that, grandparents are no longer allowed to see grandchildren. Parents are separated from children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like Jacob and Esau, because of what Jacob did. Oh, I know it. Genesis 33, here comes Esau, and he meets Jacob with 400 persons, but his heart's been changed. He runs to Esau. I mean, he runs to Jacob. He embraces Jacob. He kisses Jacob. They're reconciled, but it takes 20 years for this to take place. 20 years. Old brothers and sisters, even now within your own biological family, let there be reconciliation. It doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. If you're right, then the Bible says when you come to the altar and you remember that your brother has all against you, not that you have all against your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother and sister and come back and God will accept it. But in the church, there could be great pain in the church and there can be a Judas that will betray you. And God wants to speak to us as a congregation all over the world. Brothers and sisters who will spend eternity in heaven, surely if that's the case, we ought to be able to spend time with one another without being separated from one another by race, by creed, by color, by, by ethnicity, by education, ought to bring us together. And so there planning on an um, attack against Judah. And the Bible lets us know that Hezekiah gets the word. He gets informed. He, he gets an advanced bulletin. Because God, if you live close enough to God, God will give you a nudge and tip you off. That's what he does sometimes. When you normally get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and he wakes you up at 2.30 to pray and read. And you say to him, Lord, I know that early in the morning our song shall rise to thee, but this is a little early. Can I sleep just another three hours? And he won't let you sleep. And you get up and read. and Get up and intercede. Get up and talk to Jesus. At about 12 o'clock that day, something breaks out. And you know that now you are spiritually prepared, you're prayed up, that you can handle it. And you would not have been able to handle it had it not been for the fact that he woke you up at 2.30 in the morning. God has a way of letting you know something is on the rise and it's need time for you to pray and to get in touch with Jesus. The Bible says in verse 3 that Hezekiah, <clears throat> in the words of my grandchildren, was scared. The Bible says he feared. The king being afraid. Kings don't become afraid, do they? Yes. Karl Barth, that Swiss theologian, once said that courage is fear on his knees saying its prayers. We make plastic saints out of Christians. We make them um, mannequins. Uh, we lift them up to the place that they can't feel what is really there and they can't afford to feel it. Because if they do, you see it. We're never told to be super Christians. We're just called, told to be Christians. 
Yes, you get afraid. Yes, you have weaknesses. But you can talk to God and you can tell God what you want. You can be like Jeremiah and tell God in Jeremiah 20 verse 7, Oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. That word for deceived is the word pata, which really is the word for seduced. Hmm? You know what he's saying to God? You divinely seduced me and I was seduced. You overpowered me. You made me a life and laughing stock. I said, I was no, not going to speak anymore in his name, but verse, 20, verse 9, but his word was in my heart like fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it in. Indeed, I could not. You can talk to God. He'll give you the privilege of the first word. But always remember, he reserves the last word for himself. And because you got a relationship with him, you can tell him. If you're angry, if you can tell him that you feel like he's let you down, you can tell him. But as you talk with him, he will bring you clarity and he's faithful not to forsake you, but to embrace you because God is faithful and not fragile and can take anything you have to say. Hezekiah is fearful. He calls for a fasting and praying, gathering down at the temple. A prayer meeting. He's got Ammon, Moab, and him, Edomites against him. He calls for the people to come down and to pray. I love the first Thursday in May, the National Day of Prayer. I think it's great. I just think that it's not enough. Whatever happened to Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. That bids me at my father's throne, makes all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempest there. By thine return, sweet hour of prayer. Prayer must not be just for emergency times. It must be the natural rhythm of our lives. They gather together and Hezekiah prays a prayer that consists of three rhetorical questions. Verse six, O oh God, are you not the God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the earth. All power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. And the answer to that question is, yes, you are that kind of God. You are the God of sovereignty, which means you are in control. You not only reign in heaven, you reign on earth and no one can withstand you or contend against you. This is the kind of God who in the first chapter of Genesis can call lights and light will come traveling at 186,000 miles a second. On the first day, let there be light. On the fourth day, he says, let there be the sun. That's illogical. Light on the first day, the sun on the fourth day. That's not the way I do it. I make the sun on the first day and light comes on the fourth day. But light does not come from the sun. Light comes from God. That's why John will say in Revelation 22 and five, there will not be any light in the eschatological, that is the futuristic city, but there will be light. There won't be any sun, but there will be light. There will not be any sun, but there'll be light. I have to get that in my mind. There won't be any sun, but there'll be light because God is sovereign. But in verse number seven, eight and nine, God is the God not only of sovereignty, but he's the God of our history. Are you not the God who evicted all of these other nations from the land and give it to Abraham, your friend, as you promised? And we have built a temple in it. And we have said that if calamity or famine or pestilence or peril or sword confront us, we will gather here in this courtyard and we'll call on the name of the Lord and he will not only hear us, but he will answer us. And of course, the answer to that question is yes. God is the God 
of our history. That's why they could look back in so many instances, that is, the children of Israel, in this case, the people of Judah, and see how God had uh, stepped into their history. That's why David could say to Goliath, you come to me hmm, with swords and shields and all of that, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I know you think I'm just a boy and that I'm, in, and I'm unable to defeat you, but you don't understand how God has ended my history. I was keeping my father's sheep, and a bear came, and I killed the bear. I was keeping my father's sheep, and a lion came, and I killed the lion. And if God can enable me to kill a bear and a lion that were threatening my father's sheep, I can kill you, you uncircumcised giant, because past experience gives us present confidence. Past experience gives us present confidence. I know what it's like to hear cancer diagnosis three times. I know what it's like to hear stroke twice. I know. And some of you are sitting here right now. You are here not because of medical expertise. You are here because of what God has done. Yes, he's used that. Some of you are sitting here right now. You were voted in high school the most likely not to succeed. Some of your marriages were not supposed to be together. You were not supposed to be successful, but God has done something in your life, has changed your life, and has created this situation that you cannot stand before God and say to God when you experience another crisis, I finally experienced something that you can't handle. Have you any rivers that you think are uncrossable? Do you have any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things that seem to be impossible and he will do what no other power can do. He's the God of sovereignty. He's the God who steps inside of our history. And then he's the God of divine equity. Verse 10 through 12a. But now, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the population of Mount Seir, that is the Edomites, those individuals that when we were designed to pass through this, their land, they showed us great inhospitality. And when we got ready to retaliate and fight them, you said, no, these are your relatives, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. But look how they are repaying us. They're trying to cause us to be evicted from the land you brought us into. Verse 12a, will you not pay them? Will you not judge them? Mm. God works according to covenantal conduct. That's why David understood when he had opportunity, several, particularly in 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 26, he came right upon King Saul who hunted him down like a dog throughout the land and threw javelins at him and tried every time to kill him. David had an opportunity to kill Saul, but he wouldn't do it. Touch my, touch not my anointed, do my prophet no harm. And David did not take vengeance on Saul. Vengeance is God, he will repay. Saul finally wound up on the edge of his own sword. Brothers and sisters, you don't need to pay people back for the evil they do to you. You don't need to cuss people back who cuss you out. You don't have to get back. Just step back and let God do his work rather than you try to do it. As Jehoshaphat ends this by giving three acknowledgments. Verse 12b, we have no might. We have no power, which sounds utterly ridiculous. He's got 1,160,000 soldiers, not counting the soldiers in the fortified towns of Judah. 
And yet he says, we have no might. In 2 Kings chapter 6, here is Elisha in Dothan with his servant. When the servant steps out of the little hut, he looks up and on the hillsides he sees Syrian horses and chariots. He's outnumbered. It's only two of them, but all these enemy soldiers, chariots and horses mounted, of course, by the men. Therefore, he knew he, that they had no might. I wish that uh, America could hear, them, could hear this. I know we have a wonderful defense system. We need it. But we need more than bullets and bombs and planes. We need more than that. We need God. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No wonder George Matheson, who wrote, Oh, love that will not let me go, said, Lord, make me a captive and I will be free. Take away my sword and I will conquer a bee. I am only free when I'm in captivity to you. And I only win when I don't have a sword. Because when that happens, I can't explain my victory except to say, God did it. We need more than buildings. They're beautiful, they're needed. We need more than bodies, they're beautiful. We need more than budgets. We need God. Happy is a nation whose God is the Lord's. You know, I got to that place where I knew that I needed more than anything I, I had. I won't bother that right now. Let that alone. It's fresh. The second acknowledgement in 12C. The first acknowledgement is impotence. We have no might. The second acknowledgement is ignorance. We don't know what to do. Now, when I say ignorance, I don't mean stupidity. I'm not talking about a person that's a moron and an imbecile. Ignorance just means to not know. And all of us have areas of ignorance where we just don't know. And it's bad when you don't know and everybody else knows that you don't know before you know that you don't know. <laughs> so we don't know what to do. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, when the, soul, when the servant comes out and sees the chariots and the horses and the men mounted on them, he goes back and says to his master, Elisha, Master, alas, what shall we do? Have you reached that point when you didn't know what to do? I don't care what kind of degree you have. You'll come to the place where you don't know what to do. No wonder Carolyn James says in her book, when life and beliefs collide, when faith is stripped to the bone and all your props and crutches are gone, your knowledge of God that he is good and that he is still on the throne is the only thing that will keep you going. When faith is stripped to the bone, that's all you have is just faith. And all your props and crutches are gone. Titles are gone. Health is gone. Relationships are gone. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your knowledge of God that he is good and that he's still on the throne, which means he's still in charge, is the only thing that will keep you going. When our son, Robert Smith III, uh, died three weeks ago, our first son was murdered uh, 13 years ago. Two of the three sons are gone. I struggled with that. And the Lord reminded me, they were yours on loan. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, you are not your own. God talked with me and helped me to not only to limp, 
but most of all to lean on Jesus. And you'll get to that place when you don't know what to do. Third, and I'm almost done. He said, our eyes are upon you. Elisha prayed for the young man and prayed that he might see that those who were for him, God, were more than those who were against him and asked God to open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he saw chariots of fire and horses on the mountain. And the victory would be won because God would show up. I hope that we can hear Zora Neale, Horst, uh, Zora Neale Hurston say, the eyes were watching God. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. For here is Jesus. He's impotent. I know we don't like to hear that word. We want to hear omnipotent. But if you really believe in the incarnation, then Jesus is all God 100% and all human 100%. And he got to the place where he became impotent, weak. So weak that he couldn't carry his cross and needed assistance from Simon of Cyrene to carry it. So weak, loss of blood, etc. I see him on the cross as an impotent God who is impotent and yet at the same time impotent simultaneously. But I see him on the cross not only as the impotent Savior, I see him as, I know we we'll won't hear this either, the ignorant Savior. Oh, you're waiting for lightning to flash and thunder to roll, I know. But according to Mark 13, 32, and no one understands this. Jesus himself said, no one knows the day when the Son of Man shall come. Not the angels, not even the Son. Humanly speaking, he took and emptied himself so that he could be weak, so that he could be hungry, so that he could not know everything within his human sphere. I don't understand it, but I believe it because it took that for him to identify with me. We have a priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities and was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. But last of all, we have a savior who looked to God, eyes upon you, and there he is. His last words from the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he died. But that is not the end of the story. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Sunday morning he got up from the grave with all power in his hand. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone because we know he holds the future. Life is worth living because he lives. For God brings us to strength by delivering us to weakness so that we might discover that our strength resides in him alone. Our Father, thank you for being willing through your son to become weak, to give us strength. Thank you to your son for stepping down from being rich. For he who was rich became poor, that we who were poor might be rich. Thank you for dying that we might live. Thank you for hanging on the cross in order that we might sit in the seats of glory and give you praise. I pray for someone today who recognizes that they can only find strength in you and, and uh, they need to confess their sins. They need to come to you and find in you the only source of strength and satisfaction. 
We commit our lives to you afresh today. In Jesus' name, amen.